Hi everyone, my name is Carl Zaldivar. I'm one of the main front office folks here at bizautomation.com and I'm going to go into something every business owner and executive needs to know but few do about the core business systems running their companies. It's not a topic you'll find on YouTube. I've looked. I'm referring to the hub and spoke business model used by companies such as QuickBooks and Salesforce.com. I want to explain not just how they solve the needs of their customers, but maybe equally as important, how the model benefits the software companies behind it. Because sometimes knowing a vendor's motive can be very important in understanding what potentially is in it for you, the customer. I'm then going to show how the all-in-one approach used by companies such as NetSuite, SAP, and BizAutomation.com compare on the same issues. Now just to be clear, we're not talking about locally hosted web versus client server or cloud versus on-premise. Those arguments have been made and there's plenty of material out on the web that you can research. I'm going to be talking about the differences between what I call the hub and spoke model that uses web services to integrate core functionality versus the all-in-one approach that serves them up on a single platform. So let's start with the thousand foot view with a simple question. What is business management software's mission in life? To help illustrate this, on the left we have a typical business and all its departments. By the way, have you ever wondered why most employees work within close physical proximity to one another? Why is it that most companies today still opt to set up their businesses in buildings, grouping people with similar business functions within the same physical office? There's actually been a lot of research on the topic, and the reason turns out to be pretty obvious. It's efficiency of communication. So it should come as no surprise that it's also true for software. And we'll get into why in just a moment. But for now, I think we can all agree that business software's mission is to replicate or mirror your entire business in the virtual world of software and data. Let's start there. Those executives on the top floor shown here are going to need software that has business intelligence and really good reporting in order to make business decisions about the future of the company. The CRM departments are going to need software that helps them manage customers, vendors, and other relationships that the company deals with. And in the back office departments, there's going to be a need for ERP and accounting software to manage the financials. So if an entire mirror is the ideal, why is it that so many software companies insist on fragmenting your business into multiple mirrors? How is that a good idea? If your answer is, well, they can integrate those fragments via web service connectors. In a couple of slides, I'm going to prove why that's just not the panacea that the sales and marketing folks at these companies would have you believe. So let's move down from the thousand foot view and look at some of the specific things that your business software is supposed to do. It needs to collect data from each of those departments. That one's pretty obvious. It also needs to enforce and automate your business processes. This includes scenarios where you want to require an employee to fill out a particular field every time a new customer record is created, or maybe a PO needs to be approved by an executive if it's greater than $1,000, things along those lines. And finally, software should enable you to generate great reports. So to each of these points, we can add the suffix as efficiently as possible, which becomes more or less relevant depending on where you are on the commodity curve. The curve itself is easy enough to understand. Companies that sell products and services that are less commoditized are on the left and those that are more commoditized on the right. So if you import private label toys from China, you're definitely going to be on the right side. On the extreme left are companies with virtually no competitors. In this example we have SpaceX, an Elon Musk company, same guy behind Tesla Motors. So long as there's no competitors, these companies can actually get away with being inefficient. If they don't enforce a good process and generate perfect sales information, who cares? It's not like there's any competition waiting to eat their lunch. On the right side of the commodity curve, however, it means absolutely everything. Because here, the only thing separating you from the competitor that pretty much sells the same product or service is efficiency. With competition comes erosion of margins. And when your margins are paper thin, the only thing that can make you profitable is efficiency, which when combined with economies of scale can really make a business thrive. So if all this is making sense, why do most businesses still run multiple point packages in what we call information silos? 
I mean, the issues are well known, and I'm sure you've heard of them. Double data entry, fractured reporting. Perhaps because competitors are in the same boat, most companies have decided it's okay. But now you have companies like Salesforce.com and even QuickBooks with established and very powerful ecosystems that I refer to as the hub and spoke business model. And here's how it works. At the center, you have the hub, which is always a big software company with millions of users. They leverage those users to attract partners on the periphery to fill in the functional gaps. Obviously, this means the model only works if the hub provides a fragment of the total business solution, not a good incentive if you're a customer. Their marketing people will explain this away as being their core competency. As mentioned, the solution partners, which are also software companies, will now fill in the gaps left by the hub solution. In this example, I have QuickBooks as the hub, but there's many other hubs, for example, Salesforce.com with a CRM hub, but it works in much the same way. Both hub and solution partners use web service connectors to integrate data between the respective solutions, thereby generating the quote-unquote spoke that connects hub and solution partner. You, the customer, are led to believe by armies of sales and marketing people that the issues with integration that plagued software in the past, those information silos I referred to, have now been solved. But is this really the panacea they would have you believe it is? Well, let's take a closer look. So from the software company's perspective, both partners in the relationship have a very symbiotic benefit. If you're the hub, you get to leverage the sales force of all the solution partners for free because they're out there selling your solution. Solution partners also benefit because they get to leverage the hub to sell their own software. Remember, the hub's a big software company, so people are already using it or very familiar with it, and that makes it much easier to sell if you're a solution partner on the periphery. Hub companies also set up marketplaces featuring all the solution partners, which those partners use to drive new leads. So everybody wins. With each sale, dependency on the hub solution goes way up. So is that fragmented mirror analogy starting to make sense? Well, let's take a look from the customer perspective. What does the hub and spoke model actually do for you? How does it execute on the original mission, reflecting your business in a mirror of data? first thing you have to consider is that added vendors do equal more risk. Any one of these companies can go out of business. Any one of these connectors can break. And I can tell you from my own experience, there's lots of potential problems and things do break and you have to fix them. There's also the unintended consequences that come up when one partner decides to change their API, which can happen several times a year. Next on the list are all the integration logistics. What happens if in system one, you have a single field for city, state, and zip code, and in system two, those fields have their own dedicated fields? Now you have to parse the data, which increases complexity. Or what if each customer record can have one contact in system one, and you have a one-to-many relationship in system two where you can have multiple contacts for every one company? These are all real-world examples, not weird, picked-out-of-the-blue examples. These happen all the time, and the solutions around them aren't very good. Another issue you have to take into account is how workflow automation and reporting is impacted. Say you've created an opportunity in Salesforce.com, and it turns into a deal. Naturally, you're going to want to generate a sales order out of that, perhaps in your order processing app. And based on that, you're going to want to trigger a creation of a project, let's say you're a services company, which should trigger an email to go out to a manager and the owner of the deal, the original opportunity closing deal. How do you even orchestrate that? Yeah, there's ways to do it, but they're very complex, which turns into lots of expense and lots of maintenance. What if you're entering a new customer in CRM, which sends it to QuickBooks, and you decide something was misspelled in the record and you want to correct it, is it going to synchronize back to CRM? Don't count on it. In fact, that isn't your job to find out. You shouldn't have to figure that out. What about if each system deals with duplicate resolution differently? Which is likely if system one has a duplicate process that's different from system two. So now that you're aware of the pitfalls of writing your business on the Hub and Spoke platform, how are these problems solved? Well, the answer is to have all core modules on the same database, which now are designed to work and integrate together. 
then use web services to connect out to utilities and technologies which are impossible to build on the database, what I call non-core. So for example, we connect out to Amazon and eBay and Google products because we can't build those products on Biz Automation. Same thing with connecting out to PayPal or Authorize.net or a currency conversion service that gives you the latest update on all the different currencies of the world. Those are the areas where connecting out via web services does make sense, not in core module integration. So if the all-in-one approach is the way to go, then the next question is why bizautomation.com? For one, we're willing to be creatively flexible, which means we listen to our customers. We encourage ideas because our customers are the 10% of businesses that actually succeed. If you've heard that statistic, one out of 10 businesses succeeds and nine out of 10 fail. So there's a Darwinian survival of the fittest aspect to it. A second reason is our incentives are aligned with yours. We are a direct to customer company in part because we're a smaller software company. So we don't have legions of resellers as our competitors do. And we all know that consultants have one goal, which is to maximize billable hours. So on that count, I think we are an attractive consideration. Thirdly, we strike the right balance between custom software flexibility and off the shelf rigidity. If you want the maximum flexibility in customizing software, then really the only choice is to take something with source code and build it. You become the software company, and that's fine. For some companies, that's important, but it's very expensive. It's usually much more complex than they anticipate, and a lot of those projects fail. But for some companies, it does make sense. We're not competing in that space. We're also not competing against the rigid off-the-shelf products. So we're kind of in the middle. We are going to be an interesting option for companies that want to have the flexibility of enhancing the source code, but it's going to be within what we consider beneficial to all customers within that given vertical space. And that's our policy. So we think that makes us an attractive consideration for many customers. And then finally, the fact that Biz Automation has been in business for 11 years. We're a proven cloud SaaS pioneer. We've been in this space since you know early 2000s. We've got lots of published material. We've been reviewed by many companies. We're in popular dummies books and PC magazine and all kinds of places. So we're a proven entity. We're not looking to be acquired. Uh, we have staying power. We actually like what we do and believe in what we do. So thank you very much for listening. And hopefully you'll give us a call or get in touch if you're interested in solving your business management problems. Thank you.